Thank you, Pastor. And uh, I'd like you to take your Bibles, turn to, how many of you, all of the books are your favorite book of the Bible? Just whatever you're in today is a favorite book. So to Second Peter, incredible uh, epistle. You know, it, when you look through the Gospels, Peter is uh, proof that no one is useless. You can always serve as a bad example. How many know most of the time Peter's saying the wrong thing at the wrong time or doing the wrong thing? But you know, I love Peter. I'll tell you what, none of the rest of them would step out of the boat. God used him mightily. Listen, Peter was the one that after Pentecost, when he was walking down the road, his shadow touched people and they were healed. But you know, the Peter of 2 Peter is a different man than the Peter of the Gospels. And the reason is it wasn't just the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That was really critical, and he was different immediately. But over his lifetime, when you read his second epistle, you realize this old man was very different. And he was really an example of what our text is tonight. I confess I wrestled with whether to share this with you tonight because it is a very complex passage of scripture. In fact, when I was in Bible college, sometimes people ask me, how long does it take you to prepare a message? Well, I have literally had a message come to me in 10 minutes and it comes really quickly. And most of the time, of course, it's not that. But then there are those that take 20 years. You know what I'm talking about, Loretta? And this is one that took more than 20 years and actually is still not finished because every time I read this passage, something, something new comes alive to my mind and to my spirit. So would you with me pray that the same Holy Spirit who inspired Peter to write what we're gonna read will illumine our minds to the truth tonight as we read God's word. Father, would you put your hands in a receiving position? Lord, we just come here to receive what you have for us and each of us are on our own journey as we talked this morning. And you are ordering our steps, and yet we must choose to respond to your leading in obedience. And Lord, as Loretta said in, in her life, you dealt with her heart long before she began to do what she's doing now. And Lord, you're leading people. You've given us gifts and abilities, and you're leading us. But God, in the process, it's not just what we do, it's what we are becoming in the process, because you're not fin finished forming us into Jesus Christ's image. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will make your truth come alive to our hearts and minds tonight in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Second Peter chapter two, if you don't mind, I'll read it out on my phone, and uh, I, thanks to Steve, I emailed him just half an hour ago and sent him these texts and he already had them ready. So would you just thank these guys in the booth that make it happen? So 2 Peter, at the very beginning of the epistle, and I'm gonna kind of read through this text, and I'll stop at points and comment on this, and then we'll go back and forth. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Now, notice this. Where did the faith come from? Faith is not something, it's not the power of positive thinking, it is something you receive. The text we shared this morning, he said, by grace we're saved through faith, and that, the faith, is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It's a gift of faith that God enables us, and the Holy Spirit, when we hear the gospel, we hear the truth of God's word, the Holy Spirit makes it come alive to us. How many of you know that? When you read the Bible, it just comes alive to you. In fact, I will tell you, tell you this about evangelism, you know, when I was in Bible college, I took a course in personal evangelism, and our teacher had us memorize 58 passages of scripture from the King James Version for witnessing. And I'm grateful to this day that while I was young, he had me memorize all of those. But you know what? I almost never use them when I'm witnessing to people. Do you know why? because most of the people I witness to on airplanes are not from a Christian background and you just start quoting scripture people, how many of you from your background know what I'm talking about? It just goes in one ear and out the other. You see, our job is to introduce people 
first and foremost to the living word, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit, when we tell people about Jesus, who he was, why he gave his life, the Holy Spirit makes that come alive. You know what Jesus promised? You know, we don't have to convince people they're sinners. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would convince men of sin and of righteousness and of justice. Isn't that a great burden to be off of you? It's not your job to convince one non-believer to become a Christian. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to deliver the message. And so here's what I've learned. You know, when people meet Jesus, when they receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in them at salvation, and then the author of God's word is within them. And then when they read, how many knew this happened to you? Then when they read the Bible, because Holy Spirit's within them, the Holy Spirit reveals the truth, and it comes alive to them. How many of you know that's true? And so he's saying, look, you see, faith is a gift. He gives us the gift of faith to believe. And he's writing as an old man to these people in these various churches throughout Asia. And he said, I'm writing to those who received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. By the way, I want you to know that Earlier, like 15 years before Second Peter was written, when Paul was writing his epistles, he used to do his greeting, and he would say, grace and peace to you. Notice what Peter says. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. He kind of maximized it, put a turbocharger on it. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing, now, once I read this verse, Once the Holy Spirit makes it come alive to you, I will tell you there is a level of spiritual responsibility that you're gonna have when you understand this truth. He said, seeing that his divine power has granted to us, say the next word with me. Say it again. Now what does everything mean? Everything. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Sounds to me, if that's true, we have no excuses. Hello? If he, his divine power grants to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, then we have no excuses to spiritually stay where we are. Because whatever is needed, his divine power is going to enable us. You know, salvation is not easy, but it's incredibly simple. I mentioned that, I think, at the end of the second service when I made an invitation and several responded to receive Jesus as their Savior or back into their life if they had been, not been serving him. And you know, it doesn't say that if you know and can quote the Apostles' Creed, and by the way, Almost every day I have in my phone what I call daily text. These are scriptures that the Holy Spirit has quickened to me that I need to read all the time. And at the very end of that, you know what I read through? I read through the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed is wonderful. But you know, it doesn't say if you know and believe the Apostles' Creed, you'll be saved. It doesn't say if you know and believe the 16 foundational truths of the Assemblies of God, you'll be saved. It doesn't say if you know and believe the four spiritual lives, you'll be saved. All those things are good. This is what it says. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you remember back, how many of you can remember what day of the week it was when you made that decision and called on the name of the Lord? For me, it wasn't a Sunday. Most people, it's a Sunday. For me, it was a Thursday. Thursday night, I was seven years old, My parents were itinerating missionaries. I was staying with my grandparents in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And after Thursday night adult prayer and Bible study, as a seven-year-old boy, I came home. The Holy Spirit, I don't remember what Pastor Geist preached, but the Holy Spirit was dealing with my heart. I knelt down by my little cot where I was sleeping in my grandparents' bedroom, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. And I was, as Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, I was transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. 
You just call upon the name of the Lord and you change kingdoms. Whether you're a kid, seven-year-old kid, or whether you're a 70-year-old person, salvation is that simple. But you know what? God doesn't leave us there. He instantly, we are justified and stand before God innocent because we're clothed in Jesus' righteousness. Isn't that incredible? Now, I'm gonna have to digress. I told you in morning, this morning, I forget what service, maybe both, that I used to teach Greek at Open Bible College here in Des Moines. It was out on Floor Drive. I think they sold that old mansion that they had the Bible school in. And so I'm gonna give you a little Greek grammar lesson tonight because it applies very importantly in this text in a number of ways. There are two kinds of tense in Greek. One is called linear, say linear. The other is called punctiliar, say punctiliar. Here's the difference. Punctiliar happens at one point in time. Linear is an ongoing action, all right? And it's very important to know what linear is. By the way, how many of you know this, that Jesus said, ask and you receive, knock and it'll be, uh, seek and you'll find, knock and it'll be open unto you. Those are all linear tenses. He's not saying ask one time and you'll receive. Seek one time, knock one time. He is literally saying keep on asking and you will receive. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it'll be opened unto you. When Paul writes be filled with the Holy Spirit, he says don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, he is not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He is talking to people who already experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is a linear tense. He is not saying you are baptized in the Spirit one time. From then on, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're to keep, he's literally saying, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And when I quoted that verse in Colossians, he said he rescued us from the domain of darkness. That's punctiliar. At one point in time, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, gave his life, descended into hell, ascended again, and rescued us from the domain of darkness. And then, when I was seven years old on a Thursday night, at one point in time, like I had a physical birthday, I had a spiritual birthday, and he, after he rescued me 2,000 years ago, he transferred me into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the power of the punctilia. Aren't you glad? Jesus saves you in one day. You don't have to take a class to be saved. Hello? You call on the name of the Lord and you're saved. Now, back to our text. He said, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining in life and godliness. Now, I will tell you, we're saved punctilia at one point in time. But you know what? God doesn't stop with us there. Let me quote some old hymns, and I have to tell you, the young people probably won't even know these, but for the old timers, I'm gonna quote these hymns because there are a couple lines I love. How many know the hymn, Rock of Ages? Do you know what Rock of Ages is? Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Then listen to this. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be for sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure. Do you know that the day you received Jesus, you immediately were saved from God's wrath because you were saved. But how many know the rest of our life, he's still having to make us pure. Amen? He's still changing us. Have you ever heard this hymn by John Wesley, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing? There's one line, he said, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. And then the next verse says, he breaks the power of canceled sin. Your sin was canceled when you called upon the name of the Lord and you were saved. But you know what? That doesn't mean the power of that canceled sin has been broken in your life. Amen? Because still, there are spiritual battles that you're gonna have to work through. So, 
here's what he's saying. For to break the power of canceled sin and to purify your life, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And notice, it's through the true knowledge of him, and that, the reason the New American Standard translates that, true knowledge. There's a word, the Greek word for know is ginosko. That Greek word is not ginosko, it is epigenosko, which is an intensifying knowledge. You see, he's saying there's a knowledge, but it's going to be the true knowledge of Jesus Christ. We grow in the knowledge of the Lord, in the true knowledge of Jesus Christ, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers, you will become partakers of the divine nature. Now you know what? You're immediately in punctiliar saved but becoming a partaker of the divine nature is linear. You see, it's an ongoing thing in your life that what? He says his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Godliness means the character of God is coming out in us, and that is an ongoing action that happens in our life. I've got to quickly move on here. And he said that Notice this, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Lust is talking about uncontrolled desire. Let me give you a little wake up call. If you're gonna serve Jesus, you can't have everything you want. Our world is filled with unbridled, uncontrolled desire in multiple ways. That's the corruption of this world. But he says, we can escape that. Now, for this very reason also, here's the tough part. When I was in Bible college, I read this passage, and it just blew me away. There's no way I can this evening adequately do anything but encourage you to start reading this passage and let God awaken to you what it means because it's complicated, okay? Now, notice in the beginning, he's writing to these who received a faith. How many of you, God's given you a gift of faith? That's why you're here. It's because of what you believe, and God gave you that gift. Now, here's what he says. And there's an important reason why I sent to Steve the text from the New American Standard Version. In most translations, it uses the word add. Add to your faith virtue. And that's not a wrong or bad translation. It's just not a full translation. It's not just a matter of add this, add this, add this, add this. It literally, there's a connection between each of these things. Now you begin with faith God has given you, okay? But he says this, in your faith supply moral excellence or virtue. Okay, where do you get the faith? It comes as a gift from God, right? So he gives you the gift of faith and he's saying, notice, whose responsibility is it to go beyond faith to being virtuous, to having moral excellence? It's our responsibility. Now you say, wait, how can I do that? Because he said, his divine power has granted to you everything pertaining to life and godliness. He has given to you the power to change the power to become. He says, in your faith, you supply moral excellence. So you have to move beyond the faith and make sure that in your faith, you are living a virtuous life, doing righteous things, doing the right things. And then you don't stop there. He says, in your moral excellence, knowledge. Now, in each one of these, the verb is implied, and the verb is supply. That Greek word is used only five times in the New Testament, and it's used twice in this chapter, and actually it wasn't until this week that I saw the connection between those two. After all these years, I saw the connection of the two uses of that Greek word in this chapter, and I'll share that with you later. It's exciting. If this isn't exciting, your exciter's busted, okay? So what he's saying each time, we can add there, supply. So he's saying, in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, supply knowledge. 
In other words, it's not just enough out of your faith to live virtuously. You should be learning. And how are you going to learn? By giving yourself to the word of God. I will tell you, friends, can you imagine what God could do through the church of Jesus Christ in America if people spent half as much time in the word of God as they do in their smartphones? Excuse me, I'm glad somebody said amen because I was worked up there if you didn't catch on. Okay, let's go on to the next passage. In your knowledge, we're going to always insert the word supply. And by the way, let me give you one other usage. One of the ways to get a feeling for usage of a Greek word is see how it's translated elsewhere. In 2 Corinthians, when he's talking about giving, and I will tell you there's a great principle. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll learn this. God will always give more through you than he will give to you. Can I say that again? God will always give more through you than to you. I'm so glad Pastor corrected my quote. I sat there this morning and I said, that's not exactly what I said, but it was close, okay? What I said is, you know, God has, how many of you believe, how many of you pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread? How many believe God has been your supply and you have what you have because of him? So you have it in your pocket or your purse, right? May I tell you, God gave it to you. If you want more, then you give it, and he'll give more through you than he will to you. Because here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 9. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed. He doesn't promise to multiply your bread for food. He promises to multiply your seed for sowing he will give more through you than to you. Are you with me? Let me see your hands. I can't tell by your faces, okay? All right, so when he says he, that God who supplies seed to sow and bread to eat, that's the exact same word as he's here saying in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, supply self-control. Do you know that there are people who are virtuous and knowledgeable that still aren't totally self-controlled? Hello? Boy, I'm glad. Pastor said right. How many know Pastor knows? All right? He knows a lot of people who are actually living good lives, and they are, have a lot of knowledge of God's word, but they're not always in control, are they, Pastor? So he's saying, look, in your knowledge, you, oh, you're speaking to yourself. Oh, boy, you boy. Excuse me. Anyway, in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, there's some people that, that control themselves, and you know what? They get discouraged and give up. He said, in your self-control, supply perseverance to keep moving. In your perseverance, supply godliness. Move on to the next text, Steve. In your godliness, do you know that there are people who have all of these qualities in their life, and they aren't nice to people? Hello? And in your godliness, it, it, I remember something that there was a, a kind of a mean old Sunday school teacher, and this little kid came home. It's a true story. And this kid came home, and you know, this, this Sunday school teacher was a good person. And the little girl, when it came time to pray, she was asked to pray at dinner at home on Sunday, and she was thinking of her Sunday school, and she said, oh God, make all, please make all the bad people good, and make all the good people nice. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> out of the mouths of babes, right? In other words, you may be godly, but are you nice? Are you kind? Isn't this practical, folks? And he said, and out of your brotherly kindness, being nice, you go a step beyond that. In your brotherly kindness, supply love, which goes far beyond brotherly kindness. Now, you can, I, I encourage you to read through those passages, and they're kind of like thermometers that are spiritually gun that allow you to test your spiritual character as you read through that, and let the Holy Spirit make that real to you, okay? Let's move on to the next verse, okay? If these qualities, now what qualities? Faith. Virtue, knowledge, godliness, self-control, brotherly kindness, love, all of these things, perseverance. 
If these are yours, listen carefully. And are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Does anyone here want to be useless? Does anyone want to be unfruitful? Wow, what a promise. Do you know that we don't have to be useless? We don't have to be unfruitful. He said, if these qualities are yours, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the, here he goes again, in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you really come to know Jesus. Now, I want to stop there. That's a powerful promise. And by the way, a little bit later on, uh, go ahead and move on because we'll come back to this. You can move backwards, right? For he who lacks these qualities, all these things he listed, is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Do you know why we do communion, folks? Because Jesus said, and I noticed this this morning, that it, right out of the King James, it's on your communion table. It says, this do in remembrance of me. Why did Jesus have us do that? If it wasn't that it's a natural thing to forget. So we have communion regularly to remind us of his sacrifice. May I tell you, friends, when Christians aren't living like they ought to live, they've forgotten what Jesus did for them. You know, Loretta can tell you, I mean, I've, I've been able to preach God's word in more than 100 countries of the world. I am so amazed by the godly men and women I meet in primitive villages that make me ashamed of myself when I see what holy, consecrated lives they live. In the country where I grew up in Tanzania, my father was the one who established first the Assemblies of God in Tanzania in 1953. And one of the general superintendents of Tanzania, I mean, Tanzania is exploding, I'm sure you know that, Loretta. They, they have planted like 5,000 churches in the last six years. It's unbelievable. And they are so poor, they have so little in economic resources. And my friend and Loretta's Mike McLaughlin asked this old man, he's an old retired man now, and he asked him, how is it that the Tanzanian Christians are so passionate about winning people to Jesus? Listen to what that godly leader immediately responded. He said, we have never forgotten the desperate state of our spiritual lostness. And we have never forgotten the price Jesus paid to save us. May I tell you, friends, that's a lesson for the American church. Don't forget Jesus died for you. He said, the, if you don't have these qualities, why? Here's one reason. You've forgotten what Jesus did for you. Move on to the next verse. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things. Notice, now he says, if you have these qualities, right, you will not be useless, you will not be unfruitful. And here he makes another promise. You will never stumble. I don't know about you. What a promise. Never stumble. Do you know that we don't have to fail? We don't have to stumble and fall spiritually. There's no excuse. Why? Because his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, I want to go back to a phrase. And if you can back up a couple of verses, Steve. Sorry to do this to you. But he says, if these qualities are yours, and he uses an expression, he, when he says that you'll not be useless or unfruitful, if these qualities are yours, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. I left something out. What did I leave out? If these qualities are yours and are increasing. If you take and are increasing out of there, the promise to never be useless or unfruitful is not true for you. In other words, it's not enough to have faith. 
and virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and brotherly kindness and love. If they aren't growing, may I tell you, friends, I believe there are very few things for the Christian that are more dangerous than any sense of arrival. Any sense that I have spiritually arrived. I don't care if you've been serving Jesus for 50 years. If you think you're arrived, you're in trouble. Because you know what? You're alive, so there's only two possibilities. You're either growing or you're dying. Hello, are you with me? Let me see your hands. I can't tell by your faces. I'll tell you a word. You don't hear it much anymore. I grew up hearing about this all my time, all, all my youth. Backsliding. How many ever heard of the word backsliding? Backsliding doesn't mean you're a total sinner yet, again. You're not away from God. You're just not where you used to be. You were growing, and then all of a sudden, you start sliding back. Hello? What a tragedy. Because you know what? When you're backsliding, you're going to stumble, you're going to fall, you're going to be useless, you're going to be unfruitful. You see, the only way to, to truly know Jesus Christ is to be continually increasing in all of these qualities that God has granted that all come out of the faith which is a gift. Now I want you to notice in this word supply, how many will believe me that the faith was supplied to us, but we are to supply all these things because his divine power is available to us that if we are going to be obedient, he's going to enable us whatever power we need to be obedient. Amen? So we are to supply all of these things out of the faith which he supplied to us. Okay? Now I want you to skip ahead a few verses, Steve. For in this way, if this doesn't light your fire, your wood's wet. In this way, entrance. Carrie said this morning, I think it was, that his wife was in a Bible study group, a life group, with my sister, my mother, this year. I lost my mother. She entered into the eternal kingdom. Last year, before my mother died, my sister died. I was holding my sister's hand for the 15 minutes. I held her hand while she was alive until she was gone in that intensive care unit. She couldn't speak. She looked to me and looked to the others around the bed. And then she just looked up until she closed her eyes and I felt the life go out of her hand. Let me tell you something, folks. That's when our faith matters. There was a time when I've only been operated on once. I still have my tonsils, have my appendix, all my equipment, it's all there. I was operated on once by a Muslim woman. And for the record, I'd rather be operated on by a competent Muslim doctor than by an incompetent Pentecostal doctor. That's just a little thought thing I thought I'd share with you. Anyway, they did exploratory surgery because my symptoms seemed to, to indicate that I had cancer. I was hospitalized in Honolulu on the way to Samoa, and the, this brilliant Chinese doctor said, we've got to open you up. Now I have to tell you, the first time I'm opened up, I didn't like the idea of it being to explore. <laughs> they don't even know what they're looking for, and they're wanting to open me up, but I had to trust them. And now remember, he had said, we think you probably have cancer. Probably terminal. I'm lying on the gurney, Ruth was in the hotel I called and she came and joined me and we prayed and then they wheeled me into this no man's land between this room and the surgery and I was all alone on the gurney. And let me tell you, 
when you're going to be knocked out, and by the way, how many of you have ever been knocked out? It's not a gradual thing. Hello? I was in the middle of a prayer. In the middle of a prayer, and you're gone. I mean, you know, they give you the shot, and it's just not, you don't fade out. You just like that. And so I remembered what I prayed when I went out. I said, God, if this is my time, I'm ready to enter your eternal kingdom. That's when you know what God's peace is. I said, I'm ready. But if you still have anything for me to do, <laughs> that was the end of my prayer. Evidently, he still had stuff for me to do because I'm still here. And when the doctor t- met me the next day, when I came out of recovery, I said, what did you find? She said, nothing. She said, there's nothing wrong with you. There's no cancer. There's no nothing. There was nothing to remove. But I tell you this, I'm glad for the experience because I knew as I stood rather laid between life and death. Do you know what? When a Christian dies, the word of God says, it doesn't say we sorrow not. I can't say I did not sorrow when my mother died or when my sister died. It says this, we sorrow not as those who have no hope. We sorrow, but not with no hope. Aren't you, don't you like the name of this church? Hope. Do you know how many people in this community don't have the hope for eternity in his eternal kingdom? But notice this. In this way, now notice, he supplied the faith to us. We are to, in that faith, supply virtue, knowledge, all of these things, and then it comes right around full circle, and he said, in this way, entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. After all you do to provide the things in your life with his divine power that's granted to you, out of the faith that he supplied to you, that still doesn't earn your way to heaven. Heaven will be abundantly supplied to you. Salvation was a gift. Heaven is a gift. But you see, folks, in between, God expects us to live lives. I'm going to use another old word we used to say, victory. Do you know what victory means? It means winning. Do you know what the Greek word for victory is? Anyone know? I'll mispronounce it and you'll know it. Nike. That's the Greek word for victory. And by the way, when Paul says we are more than conquerors, do you know what the Greek word is? Hyper Nike. He said we are hyper Nike. I don't know about you, but that excited me. Hello? It's victory. And you know what? There are three enemies of your soul. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And listen, folks, the world's getting to be a tougher enemy all the time. The devil is is unrelenting in his attacks on us, but I will tell you there's another area of victory, and that's victory over the flesh. It's over your own desires. Why? We escape the corruption that is in this world by lust. You know, my dad, like I, traveled the world. And unlike me, I lived in town. My dad had nine acres out in the country and three horses. And and he would fly around the world and preach and I would shovel manure (laughs) for his horses. Okay? And he had all kinds of things. I had to mow a two-acre lawn. And, you know, put hay in the barn and shovel the manure out of the barn. You do know that's what hay ultimately becomes. <laughs> what goes in's going to come out. And you got to shovel it out. And, I did. and you know what? Dad always gave me chores to do. And I know this. That when Dad came home from a trip, if I had done what he told me to do, I faced my dad with confidence. Does that make sense? But if I had shirked my chores and my responsibility, I wanted to go to bed before dad got home because I didn't want to face dad. How many can relate to what I'm talking about? Would you put up that text in 1 John, Steve? 
Let me tell you, this text more and more is a prayer of my heart, Pastor Weaver. The Apostle John says, now little children, abide in him so that when he appears. Do you know, friends, there's going to come a time when Jesus appears. We're going to stand before him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame. That is coming. I'll tell you this, I, I live in submission to spiritual authority. I have a district superintendent in Hawaii and district presbytery. I have a general superintendent and executive director of world missions. I account to all of these people. And I mentioned to Norm Tostin, I went by and saw Norm and Cleo yesterday, dear friends of so many years. And uh, at one time I was accountable to Norm Tostin because I was credentialed in the Iowa district. And you know, I've been accountable to all these spiritual leaders. Pastor Weaver, someday I'm not going to have to answer to any of them. I'm only going to have to answer to Jesus. We are accountable in this life. And I will tell you, the longer I live, the more the desire of my heart is, Jesus, I want to be able to face you with confidence. And you know what? I still got victories I got to get in my life. My closest friends and family can tell you I'm not perfect. But you know what? I can't stay where I am. I can't be satisfied with where I am. I've got to keep striving for, as Paul says, the upward calling in Christ Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Because I'm going to stand before him. And you know this life. Would you show the Second Corinthians text I sent you last. It was actually on my way here that I texted, <laughs> emailed it to him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. We talked about his magnificent promises. Paul says this. Therefore having these promises beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit. We could talk about all kinds of defilements. Let me talk about one defilement of the spirit. I'll just pick out one, unforgiveness. Do you know that if you have someone who's wronged you in your life and you cannot or will not forgive them, that is a defilement of your spirit. And if you don't get rid of it, it's gonna, it's gonna erode your soul. You know the tragedy of unforgiveness? Is that you are paying the price for someone else's sin when you don't forgive them. The only PS on the Lord's Prayer is that Jesus said, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will not forgive you yours. That's the only thing at the end of the prayer that he says, you know why he said that? Because he knew it was going to be a hard pill to swallow when he put in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So that's just one defilement. I don't know. You know what? How many will admit we're all family here? We've none of us arrived at perfection yet. We're not totally like Jesus yet. God isn't finished with us yet. And we have a choice as whether we will pursue on to victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil by growing in him. Now remember I told you linear and punctiliar? Cleanse yourself from all defilement of the flesh. That verb is punctiliar. It happens at one point in time. You know what he's saying? If you're doing this bad thing, quit. He doesn't say Wean yourself off. It's not a chantix. It's chantix, that thing where people are going to wean themselves off of it, you know, their addiction for tobacco, right? Okay. Listen, he doesn't say get chantix. Wean yourself off of unforgiveness. Wean yourself off of lust. Wean yourself off of greed. He's saying, quit it. It's punctiliar. Cleanse yourself. How, I, I shouldn't ask this. How many took a bath today? You took a bath before you came to church. Come on. You went in there, you did it on one day. 
I showered in the Fairfield Inn this morning. You know what, it, it takes me five minutes. Someone may take a half hour, I don't know. It took me five minutes and I showered. And you know what? You do it on a certain day. And you know what he's saying? Just like you cleanse your body, you can cleanse your spirit, your defilement of flesh and spirit. But, and I gotta take just a couple extra minutes to tell you when I grew up, I was in the simile God. It didn't start with an A, and it was not three words. It was one word, simile God, and there was no B. It was simile God. You know, I was in southern Missouri. What, what church do you go to? Simile God. <laughs> Say, what does your church believe? We don't smoke, and we don't chew, and we don't date any girls that do. I mean, <laughs> everything we told about was what we didn't do. May I tell you, the assemblies of God has changed. When I was a kid... I never saw my mother have an earring. She could not have a little pearl. How many have been in the assembly God long enough to remember those days? Come on, let me see you. She could not have a pearl on her earlobe. Now you ladies can wear fishing tackle, and no one thinks anything of it. <laughs> Hello? But may I tell you something, folks? Holiness, perfecting holiness, does not just happen by taking your earrings off. Hello? I'm not making a case for earrings. Don't misapply my text here. It doesn't happen because you get a haircut or you change the clothes you wear. Those may be very much evidences of an internal work. But you don't perfect holiness by simply outward behavioral patterns. It is a linear tense. They used to teach, oh, I'm saved, sanctified, like on a certain day you were sanctified. And I will tell you, there is such a thing as deliverance, folks. My grandfather was a drunken bartender when he got saved. He was instantaneously delivered from alcohol, tobacco, and swearing. In one day, he quit it all. But his best friend fought smoking for months and months and months and couldn't get the victory over it. May I tell you, folks, Perfecting holiness is not an instantaneous thing. It is a linear tense. Yes, we cleanse ourselves of everything we know that's wrong. Stop it, quit it, get rid of it. But perfecting holiness is continually in an ongoing walk with the Lord, drawing closer to him and closer to him and gaining greater and greater victory in our lives. I'm gonna quit, but I wanna tell you one little story. God cares. God cares that we're ready to meet him. And I have said this, you know, some people say, I wish I'd die in a car accident. So I don't know what's coming, it just happens. I will we'll tell you, I, I'd kind of like to die in my sleep. I think that'd be a nice way. But I'd like to know what's coming. You know, I'd like to have a few days leading up to that night when I die in my sleep. And I'll tell you why. You know, when you received Jesus as your Savior, you were instantly ready to go to heaven. Right? But you were not ready to leave earth. See, when I was on that gurney in Honolulu, and I prayed, God, I'm ready to go, but if you got something more, bloop. I wasn't ready yet to leave earth, and he knows it. And in his grace, he let me keep living. And while we're here, folks, I just believe this. While we're alive, there's a reason God has us alive. He wants us not only to be doing things, the good works we talked about this morning that he has prepared for us, that we walk in, not only the good works, it's what we're becoming. It's not just what we're doing, it's what we're becoming. So that we stand before him. We can face him with confidence and not, that Greek word so strong, shrink back in shame because we're not ready to face him. And remember, he's talking to people who are ready to go to heaven when he says that. Do you know that there will be many people who are ready to go to heaven, they will make heaven, but when they face Jesus, they'll shrink back in shame. They'll get in by his grace. But I'm going to tell you, I don't want to sneak into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want to march into heaven in victory. Because 
by God's divine power who granted to me everything pertaining to life and godliness that I was an overcomer. And you know what he said to the church in Pergamos? To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name on it. Let me ask you a quick question. How many of you have never been crazy about your name? You're not stuck with it. Jesus is gonna give you a new one. And you know what he says? By the way, in the Bible, a name meant something. Randy doesn't mean much, except in England. And you can look at Google it and you'll find out. It's not a good meaning. But Barnabas means encourager. And names, listen, African names, Oh, I love this. Can I have another minute? I love this. In Tanzania, you know, the Moravians started a custom long before the Assemblies of God got there that when people were baptized in water, they took for themselves a new name because many of the African names had to do with heathen superstitions and pagan and evil things. So they, they got to pick their own name. Isn't that a great custom? Wouldn't you love it when you get saved, you get baptized, and when you come up out of the water in Tanzania, you announce your new name that you chose for yourself. But this name, we don't choose. Jesus chooses. And you say, and it says, he'll, that name will only be known to him who receives it. Do you know why we'll be the only ones that know the name Jesus gives us? Because that name is going to embody what we have become by his grace and power and only Jesus and us know the spiritual victories we had to win to get there. But you know, God cares that we're ready to stand before him. A number of years ago, and I'm not gonna reveal who this person was, some might even know this name, a well-known pastor, I had one time gone to visit his church just to surprise him. I just wanted to hear him preach, and he made me preach. He said, You're, I'm tell, I see that. He said, I feel impressed that you need to preach, so I preach. Okay. Well, there was another time I got to go there because a friend of mine was going, flying, and he had his own airplane. Okay? So he was flying to that city to preach in another church, and I was free that Sunday. And he said, why don't you go with me? I said, yeah, I will, but if it's okay with you, I don't want to go with you to the service where you are. I want to go just show up at the church of my friend. And so I flew up with him, got a rental car, and I drove over there, and I got there early Sunday morning, and I got an hour before early service. I awakened really early. So I sat on the second row right here. I sat on the second row in this spot, and I opened my Bible, I read my Bible for almost an hour, and the Lord quickened a truth to me. And I was excited, before church ever started. And then the pastor's wife who paid the organ came out, and she saw me sitting alone, and she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to surprise your husband. You know, I just had a free Sunday, and I caught a ride with a friend of mine who had an airplane. Oh, he's gonna be so excited to see you. Then a little bit later, the pastor came out. What are you doing here? I said, I just came to, to show up preach. He said, I really think you ought to preach. I said, no, you did that once before. I said, I'm here to hear you preach. Well, anyway, he had first service, like you do, and then Sunday school in the middle, and then second service. And after first service, he said, come back in the, in the room, the green room, and we had an hour together between, during the Sunday school hour between the services, and it was a precious time with my friend. And he said, you know, right almost to the end, I was getting ready to take off to go meet my friend to fly back to Springfield, and, and I said, uh, uh, he said, you know, we haven't scheduled you to preach yet this spring. And he said, what do you, th and I would always go there for a Sunday through Wednesday for four nights. And he said, and I always did a biblical topic like divine guidance or spiritual warfare. And he said, he said, we gotta do it. I said, yeah. He said, what do you think you preach on? And I said, I don't know, but I said, you know, there was, I don't know this is it, but I said, before service, the Lord just really revealed a truth to me that I'm excited about and it might be that. What is it? He said, I said, I don't have time to tell you. So I took off, okay? Flew back to Springfield, Monday morning. 
he called me. And we talked for about an hour, and he said, thanks so much for coming up. And he said, by the way, what was, what was that scripture the Lord made real to you? I said, you know, I said, I know this doesn't sound like an exciting seminar, but I said it was about being ready to die. And I used that, those words I used earlier. I said, there's a difference between ready to go to heaven and ready to leave earth, because I want to be able to face Jesus with confidence. I was ready to die when I was seven years old and got saved. But I wasn't ready to leave earth. I was ready to go to heaven. And I said, you know, if you're ready to die, you're ready to live. If you're ready to die, you're ready to forgive. You're ready to give. You're ready to witness. You're ready to pray. You know that when you're ready to die, it changes your whole perspective. And there was silence, and he said to me, I don't know if that's the seminar, but he said, I do know that God gave you that word for me today. The Lord has just told me he gave you that word for me. Well, we said goodbye. The next morning, I was in my office, the Sons of God headquarters. Brother Trask, the general superintendent, came into my office. I was standing up doing something, books on the shelves or something, and he said, Randy, sit down. I said, why? He said, sit down. And I sat down. And he named my pastor friend. He said, I just got a call at 7 o'clock this morning in a restaurant. Your friend dropped dead of a heart attack. You think that's coincidence, pastor? That I fly all the way there, God gives me a word, I share it with him, and he says, being ready to die, that's for me today. I don't know what, I have a feeling, I don't know what things he prayed about, what things he made right. I know this, God cared enough about him that he gave him one day's warning. People, the only way to live is to be ready to leave earth at any time because we're growing constantly in him. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. I pray that, Lord, this truth, it may not be a happy truth, an inspiring truth in some ways, but God, I believe it's a grave truth we all need to know. That God, we need to be living lives of victory. That we are not stagnant, that we're not backsliding. That the qualities in your word here that Peter, the apostle Peter, shared with us are increasing. And if they're increasing, if we're constantly growing in you, there's a promise, we'll not be useless, we'll not be unfruitful, and we will never stumble. That's your promise. Lord, we want to live lives of victory. I'm not going to ask you for confession, for repentance, for anything. I'm just going to ask you if you, like I, want God's help and his divine power for life and godliness to live better than you have been, to live in greater victory, to grow more than you've grown, to be perfecting holiness. Would you just lift both your hands up to him? Submit your lives to him. Just thank him as pastor comes to close the service. Lord, we thank you.